So um, at the city of Los Angeles, um, we embarked upon migrating our entire um, web content management system to, to Drupal. So I'll give you the next slide. Um, but before we go into that, let me tell you about the city of Los Angeles to give you a little bit of idea uh, of an idea of our challenges. So um, we, <laughs> I feel like I can see this slide. But um, yeah, so we have a very large square footage in our city. And at the same time, um, we do have a very distributed IT staff. So although I work for the ITA, which is a centralized IT department, there's about 40 plus departments that um, have their own IT staff. So it gets pretty unwieldy when it comes to trying to implement some pretty large you know, enterprise type systems. And so 485 of the IT staff um, of the 1200 are in the central IT agency, which is the department I work for. And um, over 40,000 city employees are are the number of people we have to serve internally, aside from serving the four million residents of the city. So in addition to having that big of a user base, we have had 40% staff reductions since 2008. So our service levels, um, it says here no change, but actually it's increased. So if you can get this slide. So pretty much we've had to focus on trying to deliver services online. And of course we try to figure out who are our users and pretty much people who are interested in city government are people who we need to serve online, also residents, businesses, visitors, the usual. But we also saw that there were a lot of um, investment in systems that cater to job seekers because we wanted to help in, I guess, getting people jobs in the city of Los Angeles, which we saw as a very, very important uh, user base, at least in our web statistics. So that actually got a special mention here. So yeah, as I mentioned, our goal is to replace our legacy CMS. We have Stellant. I don't, how many people here have heard of Stellant? Wow, okay, cool, from us, huh? You, you probably heard it from us. But um, pretty much it was a system that required our users to use IE7. And with XP, I know I'm pretty old, I could see some painful, you know, it was really painful for us. And we had a lot of our users internally jumping ship. And it ran on Microsoft Server 2003, and pretty much we were doing a lot of workarounds to get people to use that system. It was a fairly cheap system and our, our management liked only spending like $25,000 a year for 40 websites, which is the number of websites that my group maintains. Um, but it had to end because of IE7. And like I said, we were 40 plus and then because of the number of people leaving us, we were down to like 20 websites. So what mattered to us, we definitely wanted to, if we were going to ask management to invest considerably in something um, more than 25,000, we had to lay out our criteria, what would make it successful in the city. And so our end users, it was very important because they would basically have to evangelize. We're very distributed. There's actually competition within the city of Los Angeles. So a lot of our elected officials, a lot of our departments were actually going open source, WordPress, they were doing all kinds of things. So in a way there's kind of internal, um, it, it, some kind of internal competition. So we wanted our end users to be happy. If they're happy, then they'll start speaking about it and they'll say, hey, we love ITA's solution for us. We want to go with them. So aside from that, they were demanding a lot of features. And we, like I said, we had to do so much to just customize even just a little bit for very basic features that's out of the box in a lot of these new solutions. We also needed high availability. We we're at 94% availability when actually we should be at like 99.99, 99.95. Um, cost effective, obviously we had cuts and people, they wouldn't want to pay for a lot for um, technical solutions either. And so we also wanted departments who were doing stuff on their own to be able to have also access to a system that we maintain so that they can, we enable them also to use the system. So we wanted to support different levels of users, not just the non-technical users, but also developers. And of course, we didn't want to be stuck with something that for the next 10 years that wouldn't grow with the web. So that was our criteria. So we chose Drupal because it's free, um, highly functional. A lot of stuff is out of the box, very innovative. I mean, I've been following Drupal development um, and I've been itching to get onto Drupal for the longest time or so something similar to Drupal. But um, definitely even before us, we saw City of Austin, BART definitely get on Drupal and they had a lot of success stories. Um, they were, uh, City of Austin won best of web and we were itching to get to that level too. But those competitions definitely show who's being innovative, what are they using, and basically what I've been thinking of presenting to management, I was able to let them see that, hey, this is a direction that everybody else is going to, and so it was a 
easier sell than it was years ago when we didn't have a lot of these digital leaders using uh, Drupal just um, yet. But they had, I guess, the flexibility. They're smaller. The city of Los Angeles would have to be uh, investing a little bit more money. And of course, they didn't want to just jump into it unless they, there was some proof that it was going to be successful. And of course, we needed enterprise-grade system and support. And years ago, they didn't have, uh, Drupal didn't seem to have that uh, just yet for cities large as ours to be comfortable in going enterprise-wide with, with an open source system. All right, so I'm going to talk about the solution that we actually implemented. Um, and I'm going to start with hosting and all of the tools that we decided to use. So our solutions, um, the main one is Acquia Cloud Site Factory. And we also use GitHub, Jira, Basecamp, Google Hangouts, and Slack. And so for, I'm not sure, has anyone used Slack before? Yeah, awesome for team communication. Uh, so that's what we use most of our real time, like throughout the project. Uh, we do Google Hangouts because we're a very distributed team. So we use that for all of our face-to-face -face scrums. Um, Basecamp we use for like asynchronous communications where we put our project files, that kind of stuff. Uh, Jira we did for Agile, which was another big part of this project, is not only implementing the solution, but it was also training and enabling like the Agile uh, process. Uh, we use GitHub for all our code management. Um, individual developer, developers had forks, uh, and then they'd do feature branches, and then they'd do pull requests, and where we could review them and then merge them in. Um, and then Acquia Cloud Site Factory was like our main, like the platform that we built the solution on. So Site Factory, if you look at it, um, basically what it is is a interface for a multi-site. And so with the interface, you can, on the individual site level, you can go ahead and you can clone sites and delete sites and uh, create new sites. Um, there's like single sign-on built in, so you can sign into all of your sites without having to go remember login and passwords and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's built on top of Acquia Cloud, so it's uh, high availability, it's completely scalable, um, everything, yeah, I mean, if there's any issues, it's got 24-7 critical support. Uh, also on the admin, you've got like a, a single interface where you can manage code. Uh, you can deploy new code. You can create tags to deploy to production environment. Um, it controls or it supports user roles, so you can put users in certain groups and they can only access certain sites. And so for their needs, having different departments and then different levels of users, it just kind of worked out really well, fit exactly what they were looking to do. Uh, so creating a common platform. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about like development process, uh, data architecture, theming setup, and content management. So for the development process, uh, like the main deliverable for me was an architectural document, which was uh, about 60 pages. And it was more about maintenance and moving forward and how to keep developing on top of the platform. Um, we did two-week sprints. Uh, for the first, well, for the project timeline, so for the first five months, it was Civic Actions and myself doing most of the development, and then for the second five months, uh, the City of LA was able to step in and do a lot of their own development work, and then it was more of a consulting role, uh, teaching them and helping them get through issues. Um, every development, every developer had uh, their own fork, and then they worked off their own fork, and then they got to learn how to use Git. Um, we taught. LA, like the actual agile process, so then after the project, they could keep it going, uh, which they're still doing. Every two weeks, they're uh, starting a new sprint. Um, yeah, uh, Madeline, stuff. Okay, yeah, we, um so one of the main features that uh, was important to LA also was um, a uh, responsive site, and we have responsive navigation. Um, we, the slide that you see up there has um, 
can show examples, and if I had a pointer, it would be a lot easier to do this. But if I may, I, I could mention a little bit about the background. So yes. the city of Los Angeles, I have a team of um, six full-time members and then four part-time members. And what we wanted to do is, yeah, immerse ourselves in Drupal so that we could um, become experts <coughs> ourselves and then migrate all those 40 websites that we mentioned. And one of the first things that we asked um, Civic Actions and Acura to help us with is migrate our main city website, which award-winning, we wanted to make sure it was transferred over in, in, um, with expert help. But at the same time, we needed to refresh the site and do stuff that we had like for the longest time um, in, in our backlog. And so basically we came up with um, lacity.org as you see it here, this little screenshot, feel free to visit it. And yeah, as was mentioned, we needed to make it responsive uh, in addition, there's a navigation bar just within 10 months uh, of, uh, of after installing or setting up Drupal, we migrated uh, lacity.org, another site, and then we had a navigation bar at the very top that sits on every city website now, virtually every city website now. And so that's what you see from the very top. Um, do you wanna, you wanna go into other? Um, yeah, some of the uh, things we had here, um, so, other other announcements, which I can't read the thing. Um, yeah, on the lower left, there's so, a. So, yeah, this is an announcements um, feed that is managed in Drupal. Um, the center part is more related to um, City Views programming, but it is a, uh, it's content and so current and recently archived media with indicators um, for if anything is live or streaming, um, council meetings, board meetings, things like that are streaming. Um. Yeah, so we have, a, we have a TV channel actually um, that lets people see programming. Uh, we have like a, a weekly magazine show. Uh, we also have, of course, various committee meetings and city, uh, city council meetings. And what was important for us, we have so much content, but yet we wanted to let people see what was, what's going on now. So what's kind of cool is there's a uh, live and on demand Indicator is a live and on-air indicator, so people going onto their going onto either the responsive site or the um, uh, the desktop site, then um, they could basically see what's going on now. So there's a ton of content, and we're like, how the heck do we <laughs> make sure that people see what is going on now? Because I think that would be pretty cool. Plus, at the same time, um, people who are very engaged, people want to know. Um, what uh, what meetings are going on and also what events are going on. They can just go right to the homepage and find information that they need. So, yeah. so all of that is from feeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and those are all from um, feeds of external data sources that we've incorporated into the site. Um, we've also got a, a scrolling media bar with um, Twitter feed. Uh, there's links to all their social media accounts. Um, so they are, uh, it's pretty much, the front page is kind of just an example of everything that we did for the project. We wanted it to be very dynamic. We didn't want anything static. We wanted things updating constantly. As soon as something was available, we wanted to show it to the, yeah. the users. Yeah. So, um, move on to the data architecture. So we can talk a little bit about the um, data architecture. Most of the content on um, City of LA's website was from various, uh, external data sources. Um, their 311 city services data shows up on here. Um, we, we import that into um, Drupal recurring um, so that it's always up to date because that is managed in a different database. Um, the uh, on-demand videos are from a Granicus feed. Um, so those are actually updated in a much more um, timely fashion up to the minute. Um, you know, you can't have something update every hour when maybe it changes every 15 minutes. Um, the events calendar is also from an external data source um, that is still managed using the external um, data interface. We pull that in with feeds as well so that we can display it easily. Um, there are other feeds, um, LABAVN, um, job opportunities, things like that. Uh, all that stuff comes in using feeds in Drupal and then it displays seamlessly inside the website. Um, you really can't tell what's being managed in Drupal and what's not. 
Um, and so we did have to spend some time figuring out which of these things need to be, um, can be imported into Drupal, have periodic updates, maybe nightly, um, versus things that have to be retrieved pretty much dynamic and stored in a cache so that you're not spending a lot of time on the main site looking for those things. And, um, and then determine, we had to determine an appropriate update schedule for all that content. Uh, that was one of our first challenges and took quite a bit of time on the initial project. Um, this is, so basically we had mostly contrib modules. We didn't really have to do a lot of custom code for this, um, which is, speaks a lot to the power of Drupal and the community and all the great contrib modules that um, are out there. Most of our custom modules were features, so configuration, content types, things like that. We really wrote a surprisingly small amount of real custom code to support all the things that we did. Um, we, we chose to use the feeds module to pull in all of our data sources. It's a really powerful tool to help you manage um, mapping between external sources and your Drupal source and um, it's, it allows you to set up periodic imports uh, and Christian is going to talk more specifically about what we did with feeds. Okay, uh, how many are, have some familiarity, familiarity with the uh, feeds module currently? Good, so a lot of this is just gonna be a little bit of a uh, review, but I'm gonna run through just a quick example here um, with some of the power and things that we're able to uh, do without a lot of customization. Um, a lot of our data that was coming in through LA City, um, a lot of different formats, but uh, you know, JSON, XML, CMS, and this example here is just a small snippet of some JSON data that we would have coming in from one of our event feeds. So, you know, uh, anything from, you know, date formatting, some things like that, uh, titles, we we had, you know, a lot of different other uh, feeds to deal with. So the feeds module was really key into integrating all of this stuff and getting the content in without a lot of extra effort. Uh, so, you know, some of the basic settings and things that you're able to get here are uh, allow you to do scheduling and periodic importing, um, you know, setting up uh, several, multiple feeds from different sources, and this uh, does it all in a really nice, you know, UI interface, and it's, it's not too hard to teach to others, which is the other thing was great, because we had to get their team into there, uh, transition them to be able to run these imports and, you know, know, know where everything is that's coming into their, their data. Um, in this particular example here, we had a, a JSON parser, so we would just be mapping all of the fields coming into, uh, from our uh, event data into uh, named uh, fields on the feed side. And once all of these things are mapped into this layer, you're able to do, uh, to set up your node uh, settings and things so far you can map all of those fields into um, where are they going to end up as far as in, in Drupal nodes? Um, for node settings themselves, this is important. A lot of the events, uh, we would want them, if there was event changes and other uh, things that would happen there, we want to make sure those nodes would get updated immediately on the next import. And, uh, you know, authoring information, uh, not having any duplication of nodes and any other uh, content since we did have some collisions with other things. There's not necessarily the same unique identifiers across all of these things. So that's one thing that's really important um, with this module. Uh, and then for mapping itself, we were able to just take the fields that we need. Um, a lot of data we were able to throw away. Uh, and then also set this up for uh, any other uh, editing or, or transformations that we need to do on this data itself, um, which leads you into uh, the tamper. So tamper was really important here, uh, taking care of any other date formatting, um, taking a date and putting it into you know Drupal uh, actual date, uh, you know uh, 
field formatting and, uh, and not losing anything and still having it, you know, all our views not be maintained and everything. Um, and then that also led us to be able to do any customizations inside of a custom module if we needed to, uh, you know, transform any of that data in some particular way, like we were matching things up with other videos and just other, other data that would uh, need to be paired together that this couldn't necessarily take on by itself. And then I think we're leading into uh, a, a presentation of the uh, data itself of what we were able to do once we got the speed data imported. Yeah, I'm gonna pass it on to Steph and she was gonna give you a little example here of, of what we were able to do with some of that data. Yeah, so this is the uh, main page of the for residents section. And um, so the city events pull events that were tagged that were for city residents. Um, and so that shows you the current day's um, events. And the other thing that's on here off to the side is a, um, this menu over here is a taxonomy driven menu, but it pulls the um, 311 data in from uh, the th city services. And so these are, these are links to city service pages of the data, the information that is important for city residents to see. Um, this is a little, this is not in the LA city site. This is actually on LA city view. This is their old um, weekly schedule for the Channel 35 on-air programming. Um, you click on one of these and you just got a little, little blurb that didn't say much more than what was right there. Uh, this is what we have now. Um, so you have a weekly program schedule. You get what's currently on air right now, a big picture. Um, you can click on that and get more information. Um, below you see what's coming up for today. They now have descriptions. Um, those weren't available on the website before. Uh, the city, the um, content editors are doing no more work than they were before to um, set up the uh, TV schedule, but they're able to get a lot more use out of the web content. Um, We've got different views, so they can display this in different ways if they want. Um, and it's really increased the amount of uh, value they get out of the work they do to uh, create their schedule. And I think this goes to Jason. It does. Uh, so real quick, we're just gonna talk about the theming strategy. Just basic Drupal theming, really. Uh, we started with the Zen-based theme, something that was very clean. Uh, everything was custom, but it was really a pixel-to-pixel -pixel, uh, translation of their old site to their new site uh, with the addition of responsive in there. Um, we did use a separate GitHub repo for our theme, uh, and then we had, for each different site that we made, we had a different branch for that theme, and then we could connect those into uh, Site Factory and then deploy themes separately. Uh, everything's organized based on SMACs. Um, we're using SAS and Compass. While enabling and training the LA team, they got to learn all those cool things, and using SMACs really helped them uh, spin up quickly, because they didn't have to go hunting for code. They could just find the correct partial fairly quick. Uh, and at the theme level, we're doing as much 508 compliance as we can, um, because being government site, uh, it's very important that we do um, everything with accessibility in mind. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the accessibility module. So we were able to go in and create and define rules, and then we could incorporate that into our WYSIWYG. So then as they were creating content and adding images, they could run accessibility scans and checks on that piece of content itself. Uh, for the content itself, there's about 40,000 pieces of content. Um, most of it was migrated in through feeds or other sources. Uh, again, the accessibility was built right into the WYSIWYG. So when they created new content, uh, we could make sure it would pass because bad things happen when you're not accessible, I guess. That's what they tell me. They get sued. 
Um, and same thing with the media. So with the images, we, we were able to bake in uh, a lot of the accessibility stuff for alt tags, title tags. Um, got single sign-on to log into all the different sites and manage all the content because when they have three sites, it's not a giant problem, but when they have 50 sites, it's gonna become an issue. So one of the big goals of the project was being able to actually hand off the project. So we started it and we worked together and we built something, but we really wanted the LA City team to be able to take that project and run with it. So we created two or three sites and then we handed it off to them and they can create another 30, 40, 50 sites or 4,000 sites, whatever they wanna do. Uh, and so doing that, we had to take these, this group of guys that were very technical, um, but they weren't Drupalists. And so we did that in a couple different ways. Uh, I was on site a couple different times. Uh, a couple other people from Acquia went on site a couple times and gave workshops. Um, you know, our documentation was very focused on how to keep building, not what we built. And uh, we would do these weekly, hour-long Google Hangouts where they would just hammer me for, I mean, question after question about stuff that I couldn't even figure out half the time. <laughs> Started off easy, how to create a view, and it ended in things like, where does this feed source come from? Uh, so on-site working sessions, um, they were amazing because they were extremely flexible. Uh, I went there for two or three days and I got to work with their, their team leads and um, all we did was work through workflow process, um, merging code, deploying code, uh, how to roll back code. Um, you know, we focused on some Drupal stuff but more of it was like very big picture like how to manage like this project going forward. Uh, workshops were a little more structured. Uh, we tried to keep the schedule fairly loose so we can kind of address questions as they came up. And it was more like, all right, the topic for this morning is going to be display types. And then that could go out, that could spider into like a different topic. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we were talking about things that weren't even on the schedule. I mean, like we were doing how to build a custom module and custom module was never even like on the schedule. Um, I think the workshops we did a like a site factory jumpstart and then we did like a site building one and then uh, I came in and we did a week long like how to theme a site. Uh, architecture document, kind of hit on that earlier. It's about 60 pages um, and it's all like it encapsulates everything in the project like how to deploy code, um, you know, the different layers of caching because uh, there's like varnish and there's memcache and Drupal caching. Uh, we documented like each function of that was in the custom modules so they can maintain it or they can figure out, you know, they can read the document along with the code and kind of figure out how it worked so then they can work on creating their own or at least maintaining or modifying what we had already done. Um, we talked about get things like patching and, you know, creating a patch and applying a patch and, you know, submitting a patch. Um, and then we also talked about upgrading and how to, going forward, how to upgrade your modules and how to upgrade your sites and then how to, you know, upgrade and test and, you know, staging environment and then if everything is good, how to deploy that code to production. Um, and then knowledge transfer sessions, which I think was probably the biggest, like, beneficial thing that we did uh, in terms of training because it would be an hour long um, Google Hangout and it would be me and probably six or seven developers and all they do is ask me questions and questions were everything like what does this code do or where do I look for this code or I've got this issue assigned to me right now and I don't know how to solve it, can you help me? And then we would just walk through like the actual problem that they had until we got to a solution. Um, at the beginning the questions again were super easy, at the end I would have to tell them I'm not sure but I'll look it up and I'll get back to you tomorrow. Uh, so that takes us into the retrospective. I think we can probably do this one sitting down since we're all gonna talk. Um, Madeline, do you wanna go first? All right, so I have a lot of notes here, a lot of successes. 
So definitely um, what I felt was very successful about the project are the fast milestone completions. I mean, we've, we've never accomplished this much in such, such, a, such a short time, with especially with changing specs. Um, in 10 months, we were able to establish the city's Drupal platform for multiple sites. So I mentioned that my group maintains probably like 40, 30 to 40 websites at a time. But in the city, there's actually up to probably 200 websites. I know there's 100 at least, and probably 100 more that I don't know of. So definitely, we wanted to establish a platform that could, um, where everybody else could benefit uh, from the platform. Uh, we wanted to train city staff within that amount of time. And as you heard from Jason, they, um, there was a lot of hand-holding. He was our like, training wheel. <laughs> Um, and so we were worried by the time, you know, the end of the engagement. Um, only in the beginning. Only in the beginning, no. <laughs> but it was, it was really great to have uh, all the support and, and planning um, the type of uh, enablement for, for us to be able to, uh, within 10 months, be on our own. Um, we adapted to the Agile project management methodology, which is amazing in government. We rarely see that. And we're the first, I think, of the entire city to, to actually adopt that. And we're actually being asked to mentor other teams. So that's that's how successful this project is. Um, migrate and enhance LACity.org. It's a huge site. I mean, you heard about all the feeds coming in. It's almost like it's a facade. LA City isn't really there. It's all feeds. <laughs> and Drupal is the one putting it all together. And, and in a way, that's, that's true. And we had an open data platform launched during that time, and so that's where all the feeds were coming from for a lot of the events and a lot of other data. So everything was like API feeds, web services, and we needed something like Drupal to, to bring it all in uh, and make it look like it's all coming from one site. So we also launched and redesigned, and, and Steph t um, touched upon it earlier, that um, Channel 35, and I, I mentioned that we have a, a cable TV channel with a lot of great content, but it wasn't being presented well to the public. Um, and it wasn't being put on LACity.org uh, really well until now. So that's Channel 35. If you have cable and you live in LA, you can check it out. Um, and we were able to develop and distribute uh, citywide navigation bar. I touched upon it earlier. But yeah, with 100, 200 websites, all of the departments are worried about, is that nav, nav bar going to be um, highly available so it doesn't bring down our site? It doesn't mess up our, our site interface. And so that was something that was really cool. And it has search and notifications. So soon, um, we'll be able to uh, send, no, uh, well, develop a notification feed, and if there's an emergency or if there's something that um, is really big and the, the mayor's office, let's say, wants to announce, that navigation bar is going to have a pop up underneath and it's going to appear on like the 100 to 200 websites in the city. So that's, that's pretty cool, and, and we see a lot of opportunity for that um, in the future. Um, but I'll, I'll keep that to myself for now. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, improvement, so, I mean, it was great working with everybody, but of course not everything is 100% perfect. I mean, it's we're not in a utopia. <laughs> but um, I think one of the things that we learned is that I, I discovered that training maybe could have been scheduled at the start with more time allocated for it. I think we scheduled training kind of in between, but I think we should have started off from the get-go. I think we w it was a little <coughs> bit rougher because we w didn't know a lot of the terminology earlier. Maybe if we knew it much earlier, we could, we could really understand what everybody was talking about. Um, even though we're technical, the terminology is, you know, you just won't, won't understand it and, and pick it up right away and understand what everybody's talking about. Um, I felt that we should have prepared well in advance. My team should have prepared well, well in advance with more detailed responsive design specs. Um, we probably took it for granted that, oh, there's going to be some responsive design themes out there. It's just going to look really uh, cool after it's all developed. But um, obviously, we also had some, um, we had some tweaks that we wanted and. Um, and it would have been better to uh, list those out in the beginning rather than kind of um, see what was out there and then have to customize it later. Um, and then more time for quality assurance testing, I think is sort of a, a change in pace for us. So we didn't seem to um, a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, a good amount of time because at the same time we were also training. So that was, that's kind of lessons learned. Um, future opportunities, we, we really want to migrate our <laughs> 20 to 30 sites that we have on Stellance. Um, that's a must, and I, we're trying to do that within a year. Um, we want departments to leverage the new city platform. We want to reuse uh, base templates, so we're working towards that. And basically want to cut the development time in half if we can. Um, and then sites we want uh, in other city websites, we want them to be able to integrate with other systems, just like ours is able, our LACity.org website is able to integrate with um, so many other systems. We want them to um, benefit from that as well. Um, and 
pretty much it opens the door for us to develop more features that will encourage user engagement. We'll have more time because um, now we didn't have to. We don't have to do all those workarounds which we constantly had to do with our old content management system. So there's a lot of time savings that we see uh, that will give us uh, future opportunities. So um, that's it. I think if you wanted to share something. <laughs> So uh, for me, I don't know if we call them successes, but they're definitely highlights. Um, you know, like as a development partner, Civic Actions were amazing. Um, like I could completely trust them and I could offload so much of my work to them uh, because they did so well. Uh, I mean, Ethan's not here, but uh, Ethan was a giant part of this team. Um, communication was fantastic. Uh, like we could talk. Um, like it was one of those things where you could ping somebody and be like, hey, I need 15 minutes of your time, and then you're on a hangout you know, a minute later and you can talk through issues and like help through deployment problems. Um, and this is probably like one of the first projects where it's like it's been seamless between team, um, yeah, between client, partner, everything. Like we, we basically worked as a team. We had one goal uh, for the sports analogies and, and we, we scored a touchdown. Um, and <laughs> yes, um, uh, improvements, uh, as Madeline said, like we probably could have got her team involved sooner, uh, which would have probably helped us develop faster. Um, and they could also, they would have been able to take over more work sooner and, um, it, yeah, it would have been great. Uh, another thing I had was, uh, oh, my documentation fell behind, uh, because you know, work kind of gets in the way, and uh, there's certain times where I had to step in and do some development tasks, and then if I could have shelved that or pushed that development task off to someone else, then uh, maybe I'd have kept the documentation up to date, and then they could have been learning sooner, and they may have been able to jump in sooner. Okay. Um, yeah, some of our successes from um, our viewpoint, um, we thought, you know, I mean, we had a great project owner and a, there was a great working relationship between all the dip parties. I mean, having a, having a project owner that was as engaged and um, interested in what we were doing and they learned so quickly, uh, it was, it really made everything great and everybody had a great sense of humor. Um, you know, you're all busy, you're all trying to get stuff done, but uh, we all had a really great working relationship. Um, we also did a really good job with our um, estimation for the amount of work we could get done in a sprint. So, you know, things didn't get pushed back and pushed back. Um, so that was, you know, that was a great thing. Um, there was a lot of give and take when maybe things would change a little bit. And so we were really good at working out um, our differences. And, you know, when additional feature requests came in in the middle of a sprint, we were able to, uh, accommodate those or, um, you know, decide, well, we have to wait until the next time to do this. So that was really great. Um, we really did get a lot done in a very small project time frame. Um, it was, it was a really, it was a really great thing. Uh, there was a really good division of labor. Um, we, I think we worked towards everybody's strengths so that, you know, the most amount of work got done in the least possible time. And, um, for me, this was my first time at really working on a distributed project like this. Uh, I only joined Civic Actions last year, and this was my first Civic Actions project. Um, and I thought, you know, the, the communications tools that we used were, were really great. Um, I felt just as connected with people in time zones, three time zones away from me, as I did when I worked in, a, in an office with people that I could throw spitballs at. So, you know, that was, that was really great. Um, Kristen, do you have anything else you want to add for pluses and maybe you want to do the video? Um, I think the, uh, the agile process really um, showed and shined here at Civic Act 2. Um, we had uh, Elizabeth uh, really was our, our project manager. And, uh, she did an excellent job at, at coordinating the team and making sure we, uh, you know, stuck to uh, what we're supposed to be doing. And then we also had uh, uh, Steve Curtis on QA. Um, one thing, as most projects, it seems to happen in, in the improvement area is that, you know, having uh, your QA tests may be a focus. Um, we, we really didn't get our QA tests going as well as we did until later on um, during the process. 
Um, so it's definitely an area of improvement that almost every project seems to <laughs> encounter. Um, we had a little bit of uh, uh, scheduling, you know, we g making sure our data feeds and things that we had to work with um, being available early enough um, was a little bit of a challenge, you know, because we were working with a lot of different departments um, who all operate on different schedules and, uh, you know, ensuring that we can get the data in time because, um, you know, you got to start figuring out how to get everything imported. And uh, so I definitely would recommend uh, nailing that stuff down as early as possible. Um, and we did not get it uh, to implement any automated testing, which was a real bummer. Um, and I definitely would put that on the, uh, the beginning, the to-do to list for our next, uh, our next project. <laughs> That would, uh, that's going to cover it, and uh, I think we're going to open up to uh, Q&A here if uh, anyone has any questions for us. So our accessibility focus more on Section 508. So there's a legal compliant of making sure that the website can be, um, you know, accessible by screen reader. Uh, when it comes to diversity in those different languages, um, that has been something that we've been considering. But then um, we do have, uh, let's say, Google Translate, and that's something that we could put there. We're still working it out with our with our legal team to see if that's something that, um, you know, not human versus. Uh, machine translation, but city clerk is promising because city clerk has already adopted the Google Translate. Um, yeah, so we just have to look into um, whether that's great for LACity.org, because we could translate it, but then when we, we pretty much link off to a lot of other sites. So from LA City, it's, it's <coughs> we link off to other department sites, so the, the translation won't be there. Once they leave, the translation is gone. So, but no, we're working towards that as well. Sure, we were actually lucky. The open data um, initiative came directly from the mayor's office. So they actually uh, appointed a open data director and they worked directly with another team actually in IT. So there was a lot of resources already available and the entire city, basically each department was asked to identify their um, open data, uh, I guess data that would that's good for open data. And um, it, was done, it was done really quick, probably within just six months. Um, departments were were mandated by the mayor's office, so it helps to come from above. So they had the luxury of having that backed in from the mayor's office. Our, our redesign of LACity.org actually in Going Drupal was pretty much a grassroots effort. My team and I, we really had to put together um, very compelling numbers and uh, a use case to even go to Drupal, go open source, and, uh, and even uh, you know, migrate um, and give the idea of migrating 100 to 200 websites onto one platform. So I know I kind of strayed from it, but uh, open data pretty much that went much more smoothly when it came to getting everybody on board with open data. So. Yeah. I have another question about the feeds. Um, since you're taking some data from the public feeds of like Twitter, did you do any curation in terms of like any language in your websites that you don't want? So we have a distributed model as well for our content, uh, for our communication. So Twitter um, feeds, the Twitter feeds that we have actually are, um, it, it's a it's a compilation of all city Twitter feeds. So we expect departments to do the curation. And so really what we're only um, putting on lacity.org is something that they are already curating. It's either their tweets or their retweets, right? Yeah. yeah. And then another thing about the feeds, do you have any processes in place when you would like any, any kind of data source, external data source, that you, would, you go down and just find? Or is it even the hashing strategy for your feeds mm -hmm. always Um, so most of the feeds uh, pull into Drupal nodes. Mm -hmm. So if the um, feed source goes down, we're not really displaying the, the feed source. We are displaying the Drupal node. So for those feeds, the biggest problem is, well, maybe the updates aren't happening quite as often as you want. 
Um, for the other one, for the up to the minute things that we really aren't using feeds for, but it's more of a custom code to pull in the feeds, we pull them in um, out of band, so there's a cron job that runs to pull them in. Um, they're cached locally. Um, if that next time the cron job comes along and the source doesn't happen, then what you get is stale data, but you don't get no data. So there were pros and cons we had to consider. I mean, right now we're, we're looking at one of our feeds we wanted more real time and, and we have actually our 3011 data. They're moving into a CRM and they're asking us, rather than giving us a JSON feed, they're saying, well, so we don't have to maintain a JSON feed. Can we, can you just use our, our new systems API? And we're, I'm, I'm trying to see what the pros and cons are. They have to tell me that they're gonna be available all the time or something. Um, other, otherwise, we'll go back to the problem we had when we were in Stellant. Um, when they were down, our site went down or the pages were blank. So definitely there's, there's some give and take. We have to consider what's key data that really shouldn't go down. And if that's the case, then we need to cache it. Yeah, so my team, we're working on a style guide, actually. Yeah, you are. Um, yeah, so it's, it's coming down. It's just a matter of, is this going to be a mandate or is this going to be an option or a very compelling option for you guys? <laughs> so, but it's, we're working towards standardizing that and providing, again, um, a responsive design style guide and template so that it'll be easy for a lot of the IT shops to be able to stand up their own website, whether it's in Drupal or they have to, you know, neighborhood councils have to do it on their own. At least there's a resource that will make it um, available and, and would identify with the facility. Do you have a timeline of when that should be available? Uh, we're working with the mayor's office, and so far our goal is to have it ASAP and test it with a few pilot sites, and we have a few volunteers. So um, we're still working out the strategy of how to deploy that. Um, but, um, but yeah, essentially your, the answer to your question is yes, we're working on it. <laughs> about 40,000 employees, 400 plus IT professionals, and they're changing uh, requests and requirements along the way. That's, that's pretty off the pass. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so again, we're working with the mayor's office. I mean, with the open data, that model was pretty successful. I mean, um, it's not sort of a mandate, but it's um, in a way, I and mean, it's totally different. I mean, open data is just putting up a bunch of data. You're not asking them to use a system uh, as in-depthly as, as you would Drupal. But yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do is um, win them over. I mean, we're not going to, even the mayor's office, uh, they even know that they're going to meet a lot of resistance. And sometimes with that resistance, they won't, it, it'll be impossible. So what we're trying to do is um, lay out, you know, here, here is at minimum your, the, the standards that your website should have. And even with that list, especially for government websites, it shows that there's a lot of work that needs to go into developing a responsive design, Section 508 compliance. Um, especially for the number of checkpoints that we expect them to, you know, um, to, to have for when they go from a huge screen to just a tiny now watch, I guess. <laughs> but um, definitely um, the way we're doing it is, is showing them the numbers pretty much, showing them that if you were to go on your own, and some of them have experienced that and are actually coming to us. So it won't be uh, that difficult to sell for probably half of the departments, but for the other half, who think, oh, <laughs> look at how much, especially if other contractors are coming to them and saying, look how much I can do your site and it won't even cost that much and I can do it in a month compared to with us when we tell them, you're gonna have to talk to your contractor and, and ask for all these requirements. Why don't you go back and tell them how much is that gonna cost versus if you, and how long it's gonna take versus if you, if you um, adopt this model and use a platform that's already there, use a, a base theme that's already developed for them that's responsive. So that's how we're, that's our strategy is pretty much um, competing, competing with what's out there. Yeah, so uh, we're going to decide based on metrics or web analytics, but at the same time, we're also going to see um, basically what is, um, I guess, hit the heaviest because 
At some point, we're just going to have to turn off our system so we stop paying for it. If we're down to um, some sites that can actually be static, like we can export export them, then we'll do that. So we're going to start with the busiest website. So it was kind of crazy that we went with LACity.org first. Um, but that's how we plan on, on going about doing that, so that maybe we can really shut it down, our Stellance uh, server, uh, within a year. It's all basically just a JavaScript. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a little bit more than JavaScript, but the, the output is JavaScript. Uh, so the alerts feed is basically like a JSON file. Um, we're caching it. Uh, we're displaying it. Uh, but the actual menu item, or all the menu items and everything, comes from uh, another JSON file, which gets pulled into it. Um, so we just have a JavaScript file hosted at you know, a certain website, and then if you're on Drupal, there's a module that you just turn on the module, and then you can pick, do you want to load the, you know, the test source, or do you want to do production version? And then if you're not on Drupal, then it's just attach a script to your website. And that's on lacity.org, um, for JSON, using JSON for our, for our um, menu, because we actually, our menu is built off of our citywide services directory, so that, that uh, taxonomy that we have, or that navigation we have, is, has a one-to-one -one relationship with our citywide services taxonomy, which is in another database. That's why it was built that way. Uh, we use copy and paste for most of the content. <laughs> like, if, if it couldn't be imported from a feed, there wasn't really a whole lot of content that had to be migrated, and so it was copy and paste as opposed to setting up some kind of migration. Yeah, I'm not actually sure. <laughs> um, we, we've got some really good migration people. Um, I'm not one of them, but uh, I can probably find out for you. Yep. Essentially, what we were told is because we asked about that too. We heard about you know uh, the ability to migrate into Drupal. There's this migration uh, module, and so he said, "Well, wouldn't it be easy?" And they said, "Pretty much, there's a lot of setup and configuration. If you don't have um, something very structured, if you don't have like Stellant is not database driven. It's I mean our database, the database for uh, Stellant is pretty much indexes, and um, a lot of the content is in XML. So to configure that, um, configure." getting from XML and putting it into Drupal actually might take more time than, and testing it and then just making sure it works properly is more time than actually copying and pasting. So there may be some websites that will have maybe over a thousand, a thousand pages with a lot of PDFs and all of that and we might end up asking about the mig migration module, but for a lot of our sites, they're small to medium and uh, we thought it was just faster to just do copy and paste and we would engage also our, our end users to practice using Drupal and they would help us with the migration. So that's the plan. Yeah, we did. Luckily, though, a lot of the city websites were pretty simple. There were only a few, and the only ones that had, like, the sticky headers you're talking about were actually within their content management system. So we had some WordPress people, uh, WordPress users saying, we lost our WordPress menu because of your nav bar. <laughs> so, well, um, we would work with them one-on-one, -on -one, but luckily we were, we were um, pretty lucky, and we deployed it slowly. We had a, we did a survey and asked for, uh, asked people what their platforms were, and then we selected them as their, as the first, um, um, pilot group, but when we first told them, can you test it for us, they wouldn't test it, so we said, okay, we would BC them, <laughs> I'm giving, a little bit of, giving it away a little bit, we'd, be, we'd BC them and say, we're deploying this, they don't know who, got who it got distributed to, so these um, small group of users would tell us if there, if there were some issues and we'd work on them one-on-one, one -on -one. so we deployed it slowly without them knowing. <laughs> yeah, I think the goal was like, you know, we got it to work on maybe 75, 80% of the sites, and then yeah. there was... 
always those use cases that you don't think about where it's like, I have a site made out of frame sets or I have a site that doesn't have a body tag. And it's like. How embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> they were really best viewed in IE6. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely the community was the uh, deciding factor too, one of the deciding factors, because what, what I mentioned earlier is we wanted things um, out of the, ready out of the box. And by far, um, you know, Drupal just had all of these things out of the box through modules. And so we were, we were developing a lot of custom code, workarounds, like for Snellent, for example, just so that the interface is a lot easier for the end users. So, I, I mean, I can't wait for Drupal 8 because I kind of want to delay the project a little bit and, <laughs> and, and get Drupal 8 and then migrate the rest of the 20 plus sites that we have. But um, definitely um, the community and of, of Drupal is that was, I mean, it would, if not for the, the community, we wouldn't have all the modules and the core uh, Drupal the way it is now. And, um, and, and that was, yeah, definitely a big factor. questions, by the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. very awesome. <laughs> Anyone else? Mm -hmm. oh. back. Uh, I'm sorry? How do you search? Searching. Search? Oh, how did I use? Uh, let's see. We have, on some sites, we're, they're using Google search, um, but then on LA City, we first launched it with, um, with I guess. Just core search. Core so, search. so uh, yeah, on a couple of sites, we're using core search, and then on other sites, we're using, like, uh, Google site search yeah. or Mostly whatever. for the city, it's Google site search, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. So like the global nav bar, bar uses yeah. Google site search, so you can search across. Yeah, yep. across city websites. So Google for now is, it's, it's free, it's easy to, to set up, and that's what we're doing. So there's nothing um, uh, beyond that. Um, maybe that'll be a, a next project, maybe in a couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a challenge. It's still distributed. Departments are, it, it's up to departments to put out the good material. And then of course there's a range of, of quality out there. And so I know that the mayor's office is working to put together a working group. Um, they're calling it the social media working group, but actually it's it's really content the way I see them. Um, the, s the scope of what they're putting together is really trying to get um, departments to be at a minimum minimum standard that the mayor's office pretty much is guiding. So the mayor's office elected officials, they're really good at putting together a communications team. <laughs> so they're gonna be mentoring a lot of the departments in this. Yeah. So that's their strategy. It's gonna be parallel with our strategy in, in terms of infrastructure and uh, putting a template together. So I think with that going together, um, I think just that hand in hand in a couple of years, wow, you're gonna see LA just really improve its digital, digital presence online. Yeah. There's a question back there, I think. So we're not using Drupal for records management. Um, for now, uh, we're just using it for user engagement. Um, I don't know if there's, I don't think we have a policy yet for records retention, only for certain things. Maybe contracts and maybe city council meeting agendas and, um, and, and stuff like that. But when it comes to the web um, websites, we don't have any records retention policy just yet. It's a bit early, we're, we're kind of waiting, but um, no, I'm excited. I've, I've been looking into um, what are the big differences between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, and um, yeah, I, I, so far I'm looking at like the user interface, how much, how much more improved it is, and so excited about that, but uh, yeah, it's a bit early for us, but as soon as um, I guess we're able to, we'd love to go to Drupal 8, especially if we don't have all our sites migrated yet. I think we'd rather do it sooner rather, rather than later. I don't know if there's any, any recommendations um, on <laughs> when we should start looking, but but I'm going to constantly be looking. <laughs>
definitely want to thank, thank Madeline you. and uh, uh, Jason for joining us out here. Um, it's a, a great resource um, <laughs> for somebody on the inside because I know this is kind of information that's hard to find. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I want to leave uh, we have a slide here with uh, our contact information. You know, feel free to come up yep. here if you've got any questions. Um, be happy to help you out. And, uh, and thank you for coming to the session. Yeah, great audience. Thank you. Thank you.